Good morning, and welcome to the NIEHS Exposure Science in the Exposed Home Webinar Series. This is a webinar series brought to you by the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences at NIH, uh, focusing on issues related to exposure science and the exposed home. Today we have a special treat for you. Uh, we're going to be presenting a stakeholder engagement meeting from two of the European Union's Exposed Home Consortia, Exposomics and Helix. Uh, involving some other investigators as well uh, to discuss the application and impl implications of the exposed home for risk assessment. The, today's session is actually hosted by Paolo Veneas at Imperial College in London, the PI for the Exposomics Consortium, and so he will be the, the MC for today, and I will turn the podium over to Paolo. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. So, as uh, David said, I will go um, into uh, a description of exposomics uh, first, uh, which is one of the two uh, EU-funded uh, uh, exposome projects. Uh, um, first of all, I would like to uh, explain what exposomics and helix uh, are. Uh, they are two large exposome consortia, as I said, funded by the European Commission under the FP7 program. And uh, uh, there are several aims uh, of uh, these two consortia that uh, have to do with the involvement of stakeholders and try to respond to, to some questions, uh, some issues uh, concerning um, also risk assessment uh, and uh, transfer into, into policy. Uh, for example, reduction of uncertainty in, in epidemiology and in risk assessment. Uh, the role of multiple environmental contaminants uh, in disease risk um, on, on the basis of improved uh, exposure assessment. Uh, also, the identification of novel chemical risks uh, via untargeted omics, uh, so-called hazard identification, and uh, a contribution uh, in general to quantitative risk assessment. So I will start with a description of exposomics. Um, this is the agenda. Uh, then Martine Vrijheid uh, will talk about Helix. Uh, Chris Wilde from the International Agency for Research on Cancer will talk about uh, the relevance of exposure research for policy. And then we have two um, uh, representatives uh, uh, from WHO, Marco Martuzzi, and from uh, EPA, Tina Bahadori. Uh, who are going to uh, explain to us uh, what uh, uh, are the policy needs uh, and, uh, and what policy needs and expect from the exposure science. And then we have uh, about 20 minutes for discussion and questions. So what is exposomics? Uh, um, it has a, a kind of logical structure because uh, it is based uh, um, on uh, a few randomized trials uh, where we uh, randomize uh, exposure to air pollution uh, and we try to provide uh, possibly strong evidence uh, on short-term effects of air pollution. Um, given the randomized design, uh, uh, we believe that uh, this is stronger evidence, but it is about the short-term effect. Then we have uh, um, a two-stage uh, approach for omics. We, we perform uh, a number of untargeted omics, uh, um, that is uh, uh, proteomics, transcriptomics, uh, metabolomics, epigenomics, and adaptomics. Uh, phase one is about uh, relationships with exposure, and phase two, relationships with uh, selected diseases, uh, as I will explain later. And then we have uh, uh, the integration of these uh, um, cross sectional uh, studies or some cross sectional studies where we did uh, very thorough uh, personal exposure monitoring with longitudinal approaches, uh, uh, that is a study selected in cohort uh, based on archive samples uh, and uh, land use regression models uh, to identify the best tonic candidate. Well, I will explain uh, uh, most of these points uh, later. We have a kind of a philosophical approach which is called uh, uh, meeting the middle, uh, meaning that uh, we are looking for signals uh, through omics uh, that uh, connect exposure on one side with uh, the disease, uh, diseases uh, on the other side. So we use the pathway analysis uh, to reinforce causality. And we have a, a few conceptual papers uh, that we have uh, published uh, um, recently in the last uh, couple of years, and they are shown there. So the next slide uh, shows that exposomics uh, is based uh, on a number of different uh, 
studies or cohorts, which uh, uh, encompass uh, uh, childhood, uh, uh, adolescence, uh, early adulthood, uh, and adulthood uh, till to late life, because uh, the general idea is to have a life course approach uh, and try to connect uh, different uh, uh, life course experiences from early life to late life in terms of exposure, in terms of uh, uh, fingerprints left by exposures on omic uh, measurement and, uh, and finally disease. So, um, uh, as far as uh, risk assessment is concerned, uh, uh, a key point is exposure assessment. So, we try to refine uh, exposure assessment uh, with a, um, a model that combines uh, uh, personal exposure monitoring and omics. What is uh, personal, personal exposure monitoring? Well, we have uh, uh, recruited uh, several hundred, uh, um, several hundred participants from within existing cohorts, like EPIC or Safaldia or others. These people have used backpacks with instruments to monitor their exposure to ultrafine particles and PM2.5. So we have detailed measurements three times a year for those contaminants, for those Pollutant. We have uh, very detailed questionnaires. Well, just to give an idea, uh, ultrafine particles uh, uh, are measured uh, second by second. So we have a, a, a very uh, fine uh, um, type of measurement. And then we have questionnaires, and then we, we collected blood uh, samples. But also, we um, refined uh, um, external um, exposure assessment uh, not based on uh, backpacks. And this is uh, the overall picture. That is, uh, on one side we have the backpacks. We also have measurements uh, uh, outdoors uh, in some of the centers, uh, uh, so outside the, the house of the participant. Then we have, uh, um, uh, this, this is done for, um, for homes uh, uh, in a highly uh, exposed uh, areas of, of the cities, uh, in six cities uh, in Europe and in areas uh, with uh, low exposure or lower exposure. And then we have a, a reference site and the number of uh, um, uh, measurements uh, in, in the cities themselves, uh, which are shown in the next slide. We did a mobile campaign uh, in each of the cities. Uh, this shows what has been done in Amsterdam with a small electric car going around, uh, and each of the cities we have uh, 160 uh, points where um, measurements were made uh, for uh, ultrafine particles and PM2.5. So we integrate all these uh, uh, types of information and sources of information to come up with uh, a unified uh, um, uh, exposure assessment uh, for each person and uh, uh, with a very fine uh, granularity uh, as far as the time is concerned. So air pollution is one of the goals. Uh, the other goal is uh, the investigation of uh, uh, water contamination, uh, particularly disinfection by product, uh, and their short-term effects. Uh, this is done through a, uh, another experimental study uh, in swimming pools, uh, in one swimming pool, uh, in uh, Spain, and uh, uh, there um, volunteers uh, swam for 40 minutes. We collected, uh, um, exhaled uh, brief uh, blood and urine. Uh, we do uh, studies on mutagenicity, genotoxicity, uh, short-term respiratory health effects, and we measure a number of omics, uh, the, the same omics I mentioned before. Um, that is uh, adductomics, uh, proteomics, uh, transcriptomics, uh, epigenomics, and this one that I'm showing, that is metabolomics. Um, this is just uh, an example of the kind of results we can expect because this is a principal component analysis of untargeted metabolomics. Uh, we have been able to uh, measure um, uh, almost the 4,000 uh, features uh, in blood. Uh, this is a research done at IARC uh, by Augustin Scalbert. Uh, 
And you see that uh, uh, there is a, uh, a tendency of the samples uh, collected after swimming to separate from the samples uh, collected before swimming. So this is an indication of the fact that uh, there might be uh, different metabolomic patterns uh, before and after swimming. Um, swimming uh, implies exposure to a number of uh, uh, disinfection by products, so the final goal is to see whether each of these disinfection by products, uh, which are chlorinated or brominated, um, interact with organic molecules, uh, leaving fingerprints on, on, for example, the metabolomic profile. Um, this is another study uh, I mentioned already. It is uh, uh, one of the experimental studies on air pollution. It is called Oxford Street because uh, there was a um, random assignment uh, of uh, volunteers either to Oxford Street, which is a very polluted uh, street in London, or uh, to Hyde Park, which is uh, much less polluted. And uh, uh, we have a number of measurements, uh, which are, again, the same ones I, I mentioned before, plus uh, uh, air pollutant uh, measurement uh, with the backpack. Um, so uh, we have 60 subjects there, um, about uh, uh, six samples, uh, blood samples for, uh, per person. Um, we have a PM10, PM2.5, uh, uh, black carbon, uh, and uh, other air pollution measurements. And I show um, something which refers uh, to uh, adactomics. Uh, what we do is called uh, um, albumin, albumin adactomics. Uh, it is done by uh, David Phillips at King's, uh, King's College, uh, based on methodology developed by Steve Rappaport uh, in Berkeley. Uh, so, the method is able to identify uh, electrophilic chemicals uh, uh, bound to uh, albumin, and this is one of the first uh, profiles we have uh, measured uh, in Oxford Street participants, showing that uh, there are indeed uh, uh, patterns, uh, uh, because uh, uh, we see that there are several adducts uh, and also their amount, uh, uh, varies uh, uh, from subject to subject, indicating that uh, uh, exposure might have uh, uh, an impact on uh, um, on the level of index and also the uh, the quality and the type of index. So the, the final goal is to identify possibly new chemicals which uh, uh, might be associated with air, with air pollution exposure, and also uh, improve risk assessment. Uh, um, through improvement of exposure assessment uh, and uh, quantification of exposure. Uh, then we have uh, uh, a few studies in children where we apply, among others, uh, uh, omic technologies, uh, for example, epi epigenomics. This is ASPAC, which is a cohort uh, in Bristol, where we use uh, cord blood samples and samples uh, collected at the age of seven. And uh, among other things, uh, 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 methylation uh, uh, assays uh, have been uh, uh, performed uh, with the 450K um, array and also NMR metabolomics. So currently we have uh, uh, almost 1,000 methylation um, samples, uh, well, 1,000 samples measured for methylation and almost uh, 5,000 measured uh, for metabolomics. And this is just to give uh, a, an idea of the type of uh, findings. Uh, this is the uh, epigenome-wide uh, association study in relation to PM10. And you can see that uh, significant associations that are in blue are more frequent uh, in the second trimester um, after correction for multiple comparisons uh, for discovery rate uh, significant. Um, so this may mean uh, that uh, uh, exposure during second trimester has a greater impact uh, on um, epigenome uh, signals, epigenome-wide uh, methylation signals uh, um, in blood. And this is uh, the last slide. Uh, it comes from a paper that uh, uh, Steve Rappaport, uh, uh, myself, Augustin Scalbert, and, that, and others uh, have published uh, last year. Uh, this is based on the literature, but uh, it gives uh, a, an important message. Uh, that is, uh, uh, we have looked at all the uh, published uh, papers uh, 
where we could find the uh, uh, metabolites measured in blood uh, and their levels coming from different uh, uh, exposures, so either uh, exogenous or endogenous exposures. And uh, what we can see is that uh, whereas uh, most endogenous uh, uh, exposures uh, or exposure to dietary factors, uh, uh, nutrients, uh, or drugs uh, have similar uh, levels in the blood, and the levels are relatively high, uh, for exogenous contaminants or pollutants, uh, like lead, arsenic, DDE, and so on, on the red curve, um, levels uh, in blood are much lower. Uh, and sometimes uh, they are uh, lower than detection than the detection limit uh, with uh, adactomics. So uh, this is uh, a metabolomics. Uh, this is an important uh, message because uh, it says that uh, uh, we have great expectations uh, on the new technologies, but we have to consider that we are, we are dealing with uh, low levels of exposure, so we still have to improve the uh, sensitivity of the existing method. Uh, overall, I would say that exposonics, uh, uh, by applying, uh, I would say for the first time uh, together with Helix uh, on such a large scale, um, improved the uh, uh, exposure assessment uh, uh, via personal exposure monitoring and uh, uh, omic technologies, uh, would be able or could be able to uh, contribute to uh, quantitative risk assessment in several ways. Thank you. Hello, are you going to introduce the second speaker? Yes. Yes, the second speaker is uh, Martina Dreiheit from uh, uh, CREAL, and she's going to um, uh, show the work done uh, with Helix, uh, uh, which is a twin project uh, together with Exposomics uh, funded by the European Commission, and this is uh, mainly focused on uh, children. Martin, we are ready, so you can go for the for your talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I hope you can all see my slides. I'm um, I'm going to give an introduction of Helix, uh, which, as Paolo says, is a project that that focuses on on early life, on child health, and our main focus is on on looking at the complex environmental um, exposures that that may shape child health. Uh, I will very quickly explain why we take early life as a starting point. Um, we consider this one of the one of the vulnerable uh, time periods during disease development uh, because of the rapid organ development in in very early life, both pre prenatally and the first few years postnatally. Um, Children and, 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 and the unborn child have specific intake behaviors and, and metabol metabolism, which makes them uh, one of the more susceptible uh, groups and, and time periods. And then we believe that environmental exposures very early in life may have a, a lifetime influence on, on many different uh, diseases. Uh, and that's part of the uh, DOHAT um, framework. So we very much believe that if we start preventing early in life, then some of this disease programming may we may be able to actually shift that towards a more more healthy development, and and so uh, the prevention in early life may actually be very prevent, uh, effective. When we look at the environmental uh, epidemiological evidence for uh, the associations between uh, environmental pollutants and child health, uh, the evidence is pretty mixed. There's good evidence for a few uh, exposures, for example, for the effects of air pollution on, on growth, fetal growth, for the uh, uh, relationship between PCBs and, and birth weight, and then for the neurotoxicity of, of metals, of lead, mercury, and also of PCBs and certain organophosphate pesticides. But for the rest of the environmental exposures, we, we really don't have such a good evidence base. The, the, the evidence is, is moderate at most and emerging for some of the newer chemical exposures. But these are very common exposures, um, and 
And for risk assessment, it is important uh, to improve this evidence base. What, what are the main gaps in that evidence base? Uh, again, it's the uncertainties in exposure assessment that hold us back uh, quite substantially, we believe. Uh, we also know that we're not dealing with one exposure at the time, but that we're dealing with very complex exposures that are very difficult to characterize. We also know that we deal with unknown exposures, and we've been, we know that we've been looking under the lamppost, as, uh, so to speak, um, and, and we really haven't gone, we haven't gone very far in trying to characterize the unknown uh, exposures involved in, in disease development. Then we, we believe that there's common mechanisms behind many of these exposures. So many different exposures groups may act on a similar mechanism to to um, to uh, be related to to disease uh, development. But these are currently very unexplored. And also in this area, particularly, we think there's there's much more integration needed between the toxicological and the epidemiological evidence. So we took the, the exposome as a very good framework, as a very useful framework to improve on those areas that are very important for, for risk assessment. And we do that following this, this conceptual picture, which is actually, um, which is actually based on the, on the exposome domains that Chris Well proposed already in 2012. So here we, we have three parts of the exposome, a specific external environment, uh, which is more uh, based on our individual habits and behaviors. And then we have a general external environment that's much more based on where we live and how we move through our environment, so that we call it the external environment. And then there's an internal component of the, of the exposome, uh, which is formed and determined by the internal biological processes. So in Helix, we try to measure these three components of the exposome, and we try to look at the interrelationships between those three components, and then we try to link that to, to child health and, and risk assessment. We do that by using uh, birth cohort studies. Uh, we've, we've based it in six cohorts that are spread across Europe to get a, a a very good European spread. These are all cohorts that uh, that recruited mothers during their pregnancy and are now following up the children. So in the Helix cohorts, these children are now uh, around eight, nine, ten years old. So these studies have have a lot of data collected already, and our study design is is, is nested within these cohorts. The entire cohort. These six cohorts have 32,000 subjects, mothers and children, and from those we've selected a, a cohort of 1,200 for which we do all our exposome work, which means all our biomarker work um, and omics work is done in a, in a subset of 1,200 mother, mother and child pairs. And then we have smaller, very intensive panel studies where we follow uh, children from these cohorts and, and pregnant women. Uh, for two weeks, very intensive, during one, one year, and um, they carry personal exposure measurement, uh, personal exposure monitors, and they uh, give daily biological samples. And all of this feeds into a health impact assessment in which we focus on, the, on looking at the burden of disease of multiple uh, environmental exposures during early life. So to go back to the first area, which is the specific uh, individual environment, we use a wide range of traditional biomarkers in blood and in urine. Uh, for the main, the main reason that Paolo has just explained is that the new technologies really aren't sensitive enough yet to measure pollutants uh, in blood at a, at a detectable level. So here we use very traditional biomarker measurements. We do actually try and reduce the uncertainty in those exposure assessments by taking repeat biomarker measurements. So we take measurements both uh, in the pregnant women prenatally and in the children postnatally. And then for some of the more short-lived chemical exposures, we take daily measurements. So we measure in daily urine samples 
uh, in the panel studies to get a much better idea of the variability of those chemicals. We also use toxicokinetic modeling to model for some of the chemicals, we try and model the concentrations between two biomarker measurement time points. And then we, for other exposures, we use indoor samplers and, and, and ex intensive questionnaires and diaries to get as good an exposure measurement as possible. This is an overview of the different biomarker measurements. Uh, if anyone is interested in the exact chemicals, we can give more information on that. And here are some preliminary results. So these are the type of results we expect. We will have concentrations measured for, for the whole range of chemicals in pregnant mothers and in the children. And for, as I, this is an example for the perfluorinated compounds. And here we will also try and model, as I said, using the toxicokinetic modeling, the okay. time points of biomarker measurements to try and improve the exposure assessment and thereby improve uh, the usefulness of these results for, for uh, risk assessment. And with the same aim, we take, as I said, daily measurements of some of the chemicals, the more short-lived chemicals. For example, this is an example of the phthalate measurement that we've taken, where we measure every day in the urine uh, the concentration of these chemicals. And that is, the main aim of this is, again, to reduce the uncertainty in our exposure assessment by getting a much better idea of the, of the variability. In this case, between days variability. But we also do this between weeks. So we look at different weeks throughout the year and look at the variability uh, in the short-lived chemicals uh, between um, different weeks of measurement. And that will give us a much better idea of the uncertainties in these uh, exposure assessments so that we can take that into account into our, in our final uh, risk estimation. And then moving on to the second area, this is, uh, as I said, the general external environment, which is really aiming to measure a, a type of outdoor exposome. Um, in Helix, we focus on air pollution, noise, the built environment of green spaces, UV radiation, and temperature measurements. And we do that in, using two main methods. One is GIS and remote sensing. So we're making maps of all our study areas for these five exposures. Um, and then we also follow our participants in the panel studies with these personal exposure monitors. These are backpacks carried by the children. And it's the, at the same time, uh, these children carry uh, smartphones with, uh, with an accelerometer and, and GPS so that we can locate them and we can measure their physical activity. So that way, we can get data that links their location with their physical activity patterns and their air pollution exposures, for example. So that will give us very detailed information on the movements, and on where people uh, get their exposures, and on how that is linked to their physical activity. Another example is the, is the questionnaires that we, we have a, developed a specific uh, GIS questionnaire in which we ask people to show us on a map uh, the, the route that they take, for example, uh, going to school. And we can link that with our uh, pollution map. Okay get a very good idea of how um, how somebody's movement in their environment are linked to their pollution exposure, to their exposome. And this is another example of the type of data we expect. Um, by mapping uh, different exposures, we will be able to characterize uh, air pollution, noise, and green spaces in all the study areas in Helix. So that will give us a very good idea of the of the outdoor exposome. And then that will enable us to try and combine uh, the exposures from area one and area two. So if the individual exposures and the, and the external outdoor exposures. Um, and we've done that. This is an example of a, of a study we did in, in one of our cohorts, the INMA cohort in Spain, where we already have measurements of 100 exposures during pregnancy. 
And we did a, a first study describing the exposome of these uh, pregnant women by showing the correlations between all these exposures. So this is just a picture of how exposures correlate, and, and this is... Um, it's obviously very specific to each location, but it gives us very good information on, on what type of data to expect and what people's exposomes might actually look like in, in different locations. And this is the type of thing that will, Helix will repeat in different study areas. Um, and then the third area is to in integrate the, the internal exposome. We will try and determine the molecular signatures associated with the environmental exposures in Helix by analyzing the omics profiles, and, and we, we focus on metabolites, proteins, RNA transcripts, and DNA methylation. And these are the, the specific methods that will be used in case anyone is interested. We do a metabolomics platforms. Proteomics is quite limited, but we do the full transcriptomics arrays and, uh, and the 450K DNA methylation chip. So that work, the internal, ex the characterization of the internal exposome, um, we have two main parts of that work. One is, uh, this work will be done in the panel studies where we have very good personal exposure measurements for the other exposures and for the for the repeated biomarker exposure. So we have these biological samples collected in two periods, which means that we, we will also be able to look at the omics uh, signals at the end of those two periods, and we will be able to look at the variability in the omics signals uh, between the two different seasons. And we can link this to the short-term personal exposure data. And then the second part is to, to employ the same omics techniques in the subcohort of 1,200 children at the age of six to nine years. And these are the subcohort children where we have all the other biomarkers for the pollutants and all the, all the data on the external exposome. So we'll be able to link those omics signals to the long-term exposure data with some a priori exposure groups uh, for long-term exposure. And then we will be able to link that to the health outcome data that we're collecting at, and, um, in the children. And as part of that, we will analyze the biological, we will do a biological pathway analysis. And then, as, as a final part, this, this data will be, the three different parts of the exposome will be linked to child health in three main areas, uh, including neurodevelopment, growth and obesity, and respiratory health. And we've, um, we've collected all this data through common protocols and questionnaires in the six cohorts, um, using, for example, a neurodevelopmental computer testing, um, full clinical assessment of the children, and uh, questionnaires with the parents. So what will that bring us, or how will those uh, results help risk assessment? Well, um, we really hope that we'll be, by using this data, we can reduce the uncertainties in risk assessment. Uh, first of all, by reducing uncertainty in the exposure assessment. So as I said, we, we focus a lot on trying to characterize the uncertainties <laughs> and um, uh, characterizing the uncertainties and quantifying them. And um, Secondly, we will try and, and make a big effort to actually describe the exposome. So how do, how, what does an exposome, somebody's exposome look like and how do the exposures correlate? We also want to try and, and see what determines a person's exposome and how are social and other predictors related to, to somebody's uh, environmental exposure experience. Um, we want to get better estimates of how um, exposures, environmental exposures, affect child health, or how a certain exposome affects child health. We, we hope to get better um, uh, risk estimates for this. And then we will look for the molecular markers that may be able to predict the person's exposome or his, his or her environmental health risk. And if we can, we would like to use this data to identify common mechanistic pathways. 
So those are the ways in which, it, the ways in which we think we may be able to reduce uncertainties in risk assessment, um, specifically related to multiple environmental health risks in early life. So Halix is not aiming to go one chemical, one health outcome. We really want to focus on, on the com more complex picture and on the multiple um, environmental exposures and how those together may influence uh, disease risk in early life. And apart from that, I think what AILIX will bring is a, is a data warehouse where for the first time in the same individuals, in 1,200 subjects, mothers and children across Europe, we have used common protocols to, uh, to measure pre- and postnatal environmental exposures, both individual and in the outdoor environment, where we have multi-omics measurements and where we have measured uh, through common protocols the, the child health outcomes that uh, that form the main basis for, for lifetime disease risk. And then we, we obviously, we've spent a lot of uh, effort on, on developing the tools to do this, on the personal exposure monitoring kits, on the, the GIS questionnaires. Uh, we're developing or we're exploring the statistical methods to deal with all exposures and the correlations between the exposures. We're developing an R package that can deal with the activities. And as part of all that, we are evaluating the many challenges um, of the exposome. So I think those are also uh, substantial contributions uh, of, the, of this project and, 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 and of exposomics, obviously, um, to this field. Okay. And then I would like to finish by by thanking all the, uh, the the whole Helix consortium. There's many people working on this. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Martine. So our next presenter is uh, Christopher Wild, the director of the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Okay, thank you. Just uh, drawing up the slides onto the screen here. So I think uh, these two presentations have been very helpful just in showing the research that's going on, trying to use the exposome to address uh, some key questions. And in a sense, I'm just going to take a, a step back now and uh, put some of that work into context and hopefully just draw out again uh, in a different way some of the areas where this type of initiative can help us. With, uh, with research aimed towards uh, policy and affecting change in, in relation to cancer control. Um, so I'm going to do two things. I, I thought I would just introduce a little bit the concept of the exposome and uh, its importance and why this will be helpful. And then uh, pick some examples of the application, particularly drawing out some of the points that have already been made about the types of areas where this, uh, this work can be useful. So I'll go through these two in uh, order. So first of all, just to remind us of the, the reason why we uh, started on this, this idea uh, around 10 years ago now. I mean, the first was the recognition that most common chronic diseases have an environmental or lifestyle etiology. Uh, and indeed, in the cancer field, there are many common cancers for which we still don't understand the causes. Uh, and linked to that problem, that challenge, was the fact that uh, for many exposures, measurement remains problematic and uh, can lead to misclassification and weaken the, uh, the, the studies that we're able to perform. In parallel, there was a huge investment being made in cohort studies with uh, biobanks and the promise of those studies was that they would help us elucidate the complex etiology of these chronic diseases. But again, that was predicated on having accurate exposure assessment available. So it seemed as if we were racing towards the cohorts becoming mature uh, for analysis, but may not have the tools to perform that analysis. And then at the same time, there were these major advances in understanding cancer biology, which were emerging and also associated tools uh, for analysis of, of the genome uh, that were providing new opportunities. And the thought was perhaps some of this technology and this knowledge could help us uh, improve on exposure assessment. 
So I put up here just so uh, we've got a clear picture. This is from the recently published Dictionary of Epidemiology, the definition of the exposome. Um, so a potential measure of the effects of life course exposures on health. And um, as has already been described, it's uh, the totality of exposures that an individual faces from conception through to death. And those are in, one can think of uh, several different categories of exposures uh, just highlighted on the slide. And then, of course, the hope is that this characterization of the exposome will help us uh, address possible associations with health outcomes. And I just emphasize really a point that's been made already that the, uh, the, the challenge, one of the challenges of the exposome is really this changing pattern of exposures over time. And I think this is one of the main differences with characterizing an individual's genome is that it's much more difficult to imagine characterizing the exposome for an individual over the life course but we're much more likely to use this approach to capture a broad range of exposures at a given point in time in studies in, uh, in populations and comparing that with uh, subsequent outcomes, disease, or intermediate markers. So the challenges in characterizing the exposome I think uh, come out from the previous presentations, the scale and complexity of the exposure profile, I mean, moving everything from things like the gut microbiome uh, endogenously through to things like the built environment uh, at, the, uh, at the social level. Um, but this is dynamic over time, and there is therefore possibility of critical windows of exposure, for example, early in life as addressed in the helix. Uh, but also there will be major lifestyle changes over time, for example, moving residents, changing jobs, and, and so on. However, even a, a Partial characterization of the exposome can bring major benefits. And I think this is one of the key messages I'd like to bring across is that despite the complexity of the challenge, that we can make good progress uh, by, by even a partial characterization. I think I'd like to also really clarify the difference between the exposome, which we're trying to capture, and then the different tools that we can bring to bear on that challenge. And whilst there's been a lot of discussion of uh, biomarkers in terms of characterizing the exposome, and we've heard of some of those in the two presentations already uh, shown on this table, there are many other technological developments, and I think NIEHS has been really uh, providing some leadership in this area, supporting these developments in things like sensor technologies, uh, to look at uh, exposures such as pollutants, uh, physical activity, stress, uh, the location of, of an individual, uh, noise, behavior, and experiences. And all these can be captured by uh, different sensor technologies, including uh, smartphones. As well, we have imaging that we can bring to bear on some of the exposures of interest, for example, for the diet, uh, environment, social interactions and also other miniaturized electronic devices, again, featured in the two projects we've just heard about, to measure things like lung function, or blood pressure, heart rate variability, and so on. So I think that's uh, important to just consider which is the type of technology we need to bring to bear to capture different components of the exposome. I tried to structure on this slide a little bit the areas where exposome research may be directly relevant for policy. So I think we've heard already a major contribution is for uh, establishing causes. And, uh, and one can perhaps break that down a little bit into exposure assessment in epidemiological studies. I think particularly this ability to capture co-exposures and um, this may allow us also to better assess the impact of confounders in those epidemiological studies. Uh, there's a possibility that this information will, will refine the dose response data for subsequent risk assessment. And also, I think importantly, the link between the exposure and then the biological changes that we see 
may provide us information on biological plausibility of those associations uh, and, and further support conclusions on uh, the, the causality of those associations, as well as helping us bridge experimental and human data. I think also this approach can uh, help us evaluate interventions, so provide short-term endpoints, mechanism-based biomarkers that can be uh, used. I think also stratifying the risk within a population, so within susceptible subgroups or, uh, as I said, critical windows in time. And also, uh, importantly, I think, provide us with new tools for surveillance of exposure, uh, monitoring, for example, the prevalence and level of exposure within a population. And what I'm going to do now is just give a few examples where I'll try to bring out those points more clearly. And I would say the examples are not too important in themselves, but really just to illustrate the type of points that I've been trying to make. So one of the areas where certainly we would say we struggle to get accurate exposure measurement is, is in the area of diet. And I've put an example up here of dietary assessment by metabolomics. So this study took advantage of the large prospective investigation of uh, nutrition and cancer in Europe, the EPIC study, in a subset of subjects where we had 24-hour dietary recalls and 24-hour urine samples at the same time point from a given individual. And uh, August and Scalbert and colleagues looked by high-resolution uh, mass spec at the uh, metabolite profiles in these urine samples. And what the uh, panel on the right is showing is just for different, and we, we selected here uh, polyphenol-rich uh, food items, so coffee, uh, red wine, citrus fruits, tea, apples and pears, and chocolate. And the, uh, the, the, the red uh, bars are just showing the stronger correlations between individual metabolites. Uh, among a starting uh, range of 14,000 different uh, metabolite peaks in these analyses. And you can see that for different uh, components of the, of the diet, there are different uh, uh, metabolites which are uh, strongly correlated with intake of those different uh, uh, dietary in, uh, intakes. So there are around 2,200 2, features correlated to the intake of these six different foods. And because of the availability of uh, the, the Phenol uh, Explorer database, uh, Dr. Scalbert and his colleagues were then able to annotate these different metabolites and identify them in relation to the, uh, the intakes that were measured from the dietary recalls. So on the left-hand part of this slide, you can see the uh, individual metabolites that are, uh, that are strongly correlated with the intake of the individual um, dietary items and the structure of those metabolites is shown along the bottom of the panel. So these were the six polyphenol metabolites that were the best predictors of food intake. And on the right-hand side are just the, uh, the, the best uh, additional markers that were discovered for those, those particular food intakes. But I think the important thing, underlying point is the generation of these new biomarkers of dietary intake from an initial uh, screening using the metabolomics approach. Another way to uh, get fresh clues about etiology is shown on this slide, this time coming from a genomic study. So in this case, we had uh, renal cell cancers from across Europe, four different populations, whole genome sequencing, and you can see in the bottom panel the uh, proportion of the different types of base pair substitutions in the same type of cancer across these populations. Without dwelling on the detail, I think it's very clear that the samples from Romania show this strikingly different uh, mutation pattern with a lot of ATTA mutations uh, in comparison to the other countries. And this pattern was repeated in a subsequent set of samples. And this uh, is a very striking, quite rare type of mutation that had been previously associated with aristolochic acid uh, 
uh, an environmental carcinogen, a known human carcinogen, but that had been only associated with a different type of cancer, urothelial tract uh, tumors. So the hypothesis was generated really from this agnostic uh, whole genome sequencing approach that perhaps this carcinogen was playing an etiologic uh, role in the causation of renal cancer. And uh, we heard just before about the uh, adaptomics work, and so we were able to... Um, sorry, the slides are frozen here. Ah, there we go. So, so in collaboration with Dr. Tureski in the States, we were able to uh, actually look at the presence of this same chemical bound to DNA, so uh, DNA addicts, in the uh, normal kidney tissue from the four populations. And we're shown on this slide, we're able to observe that the DNA addict was only present in the uh, specimens from Romania. So this really provided us with a combination of DNA addict measurements together with the initial mutation uh, analysis and, uh, and really emphasize the uh, association between this exposure and uh, this particular type of cancer. So it's a really fresh hypothesis about the cause of cancer coming from this approach. And what we're able to do is to use uh, cell systems, uh, mouse cells in vitro, combined with uh, specimens from carcinogen bioassays and human tumors and also data in cancer genome repositories and try to put our observations from the human tumors in the context of uh, uh, studies in, from these other sources of information. Um, this slide is just showing some data generated uh, in, at the top panel in uh, human, uh, in, in uh, mouse um, embryonic fibroblasts treated with aristolochic acid in vitro, uh, and then data from different human specimens where exposure to this aristolochic acid has been established as, as occurring at a high level. And just showing in that red panel there the common signature that's seen both experimentally as well as in the, the human specimens. So just very quickly, I want to give one example of the early life exposures and the way, again, we can start to, to, to see an impact of exposure on, uh, in this case, cord blood methylation. So aflatoxins are very potent human carcinogens. Uh, we know that exposure occurs in utero. And the top left-hand panel is just showing in a group of women from the Gambia the level of aflatoxin in their blood during pregnancy. And to, uh, to go quickly through this slide, I just draw your attention to the right-hand panel, which is then showing the, uh, the, the alteration in methylation at 71 different CPG sites in the cord blood cells uh, of, the, of the child um, at birth in relation to the aflatoxin exposure level in the mother during the uh, final trimester of pregnancy. And to cut a long story short on this, the observation was that that aflatoxin exposure was associated with some significant changes in the degree of methylation at, at those different sites, and uh, these clustered into different types of uh, or categories of genes, and interestingly, things like aflatoxin detoxification genes were showing up. But this is an example where we can really bring together a specific exposure measure and look at uh, a pattern of change uh, in response to at a critical period of life. And I'll just give one example on monitoring interventions. So going back to the, uh, the, the nutrition studies, and in this case, um, these are the, uh, this is a correlation between some different metabolites in the urine in relation to different types of uh, meat intake. And you have two types of marker here, the anserine at the top on the right, showing this very specific correlation with chicken uh, consumption measured from 24-hour dietary recall. And in the bottom, another metabolite, which is seen elevated uh, in, uh, more independently of the type of meat being consumed. 
So this is a cross-sectional study in uh, the EPIC cohort. And then the investigators went on to actually do some um, interventions with four parallel groups, uh, given different types of meat to eat for three weeks with increasing levels of intake over time. And again, looking at those uh, two different metabolites as biomarkers of intake. And again, I think you can see in the top panel with anserine, you see this increased dose-dependent uh, increase in the metabolite with chicken intake only, uh, whereas the other biomarker is more general for meat intake and, again, is increasing in general with uh, increasing intake across time. So this type of approach is allowing us to draw out some quite uh, specific markers which are promising for further validation. So just finally, I want to mention a couple of things about IARC monographs. Um, we're trying to uh, categorize much more the type of information about mechanisms of uh, action of different um, uh, agents under evaluation. We've identified these 10 uh, key characteristics. Uh, this you, can, you can also see this. I think it's in press now in EHP. And I think the, uh, the exposome can help us in this context of carcinogen evaluation by revealing interactions between agents acting through key uh, characteristics. And also the exposomic data could be analyzed for evidence of, of those 10 key characteristics and help us generate new hypotheses, but also perhaps plausible grouping of agents that are acting through common pathways. So I'm just going to finish with one or two uh, summary slides as my time comes to an end in terms of uh, where we should take this field now. And these are just personal views. I think, first of all, we continue to develop and validate a wide range of approaches to characterize the exposome. I think we have to always keep in mind that being able to link back the measures that we make, the sort of profile of metabolites or, or, or gene expression profiles back to modifiable exposures and make that linkage in order to be able to intervene in the modifiable disease risk. Uh, I think there, are, there is a strong case also for having methods for targeted exposure assessment where a specific exposure is of interest. So whilst we're trying to capture a wider and wider range of exposures in a single approach, I think uh, there's still a place when we have a, a, a really a, an exposure that we're particularly interested in to try and uh, develop those specific markers. And ensuring that the quality of measurement is not compromised by the quantity of measurements. Um, this also is, is key as we multiply up the number of parameters that are being captured. How sure are we of the quality of each of those individual measures that we're then entering into um, statistical analysis, for example? I think a key area where the exposome can help us, and this has been touched on already, is how exposures are correlated. Um, there's been some quite interesting work, and I just draw attention in this slide to a paper on the exposome correlation globe based on the NHANES uh, by Patel and Manrai. Understanding how routes of exposure and co-occurring exposures can be addressed. Um, in an analogous fashion to haplotypes or tagging uh, variants. And this will help us identify potential confounders, but also the correlation structure between covariants uh, in the studies that we're conducting. And then also disease-related combinations of exposures, how uh, different exposures combine to alter disease risk. I think there's a, a need to think very carefully in interpreting the data to differentiate what's giving us an indication of exposure versus what is a consequence of that exposure, in other words, the biological effects. And this uh, also is pointing to the approach that Paolo described earlier, the meet in the middle approach. We need more emphasis, I believe, on appropriate biostatistical methods for data analysis of these complex multiple exposures, and that, that's beginning to happen. It's a crucial area. And also the 
the level at which we can interpret uh, and apply the information that we generate. Does the exposome that we measure in our epidemiological studies, is it giving us uh, information for public health interventions, or is it giving us information that's relevant for, um, for, for individuals? And there's, there's some differences there between the genomic and the exposomic approach. And then I think we have to move, as we are doing in the two projects that you've heard about, from the, the concept to the application and really see if it works in practice. And I think that's what's so exciting about the, the projects that are ongoing in Europe and uh, in North America at this time. So I close there and thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, um, now I would like to introduce uh, uh, two other speakers uh, who are experts uh, involved in, uh, in policy and policy making. Uh, the first one is Marco Martuzzi from uh, WHO. Marco, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. I'm, I'm pulling up my slides. Right. Um, I hope you can see my slides now and you can hear me uh, all right. And um, um, hello and greetings from, from Bonn in Germany. And uh, thank you very much for uh, the invitation to this uh, um, uh, webinar and for the previous uh, presentations that were very useful, actually, to, for me to um, uh, share with you the kind of reflections and, and needs that uh, from the Regional Office for Europe of WHO uh, come um, very uh, it's very natural to, to ask a number of questions to, to these um, expert uh, groups. I work in the WHO European Center for Environment and Health, and essentially what we do here is we work with uh, governments and advise uh, them on um, policy issues. Uh, our office produces uh, guidelines, and in general it provides assistance to member states uh, on environment and health. And uh, our region, the European region of WHO, is very uh, large and very heterogeneous. Uh, it includes all of the Western European countries, but also the um, former Soviet countries and the Balkans and Israel. So there's a very, very uh, uh, broad variety of issues in environment and health that um, governments um, uh, face. And uh, in this process, it's a process that our, our support to, to member states goes back to the late 80s. And um, it's a long story, but to make it, to, to, to get it short, uh, these are the kind of topics that are on the table in the policy discussion. Uh, and we are now working towards the sixth ministerial conference on environment and health that, that will take place in 2017. And these topics are those that have been through a, a process of negotiation between ourselves, the Ministries of Health, the Ministries of Environment, a number of other stakeholders like UN agencies, uh, NGOs, and so forth. Uh, these are the kind of uh, topics that we uh, are looking at. And you see that there's a mix of the kind of traditional environment and health um, um, risk factors like air or water or um, chemical agents, uh, but also uh, with a mixture of those with um, broad sector-wide uh, or broad categories of, of um, environmental health issues uh, like uh, food or waste or, or the urban environment, all of which uh, is looked at uh, through, uh, with consideration on a broad model of health, which includes the sort of hard endpoints that we've been mainly hearing about, but also uh, dimensions of um, well-being. And increasingly so, uh, we're paying attention to the uh, consideration of uh, sustainability of various uh, policies. <clears throat> so we are definitely definitely uh, considering a, a, a broad notion of health, including well-being and perceived health, I guess, and a broad notion of environment. 
which uh, includes the, the physical environment, but also the broad natural environment and the social, urban, uh, these sort of um, uh, dimensions, which of course make uh, the um, expert on science very, very relevant. I mean, the, one of the challenges is really to try and, and uh, include all of these, uh, uh, this high level of generality into the um, dialogue that we have in member states and the, try we, the way we, we essentially try to promote uh, evidence-based um, uh, policy making in environment and health. So um, um, these are kind of questions that uh, out of those topics we are currently uh, engaged uh, in and we're trying to uh, provide information uh, and answer, uh, answer questions that uh, <coughs> include um, uh, questions like these, and this is a real-life example. Um, so, for example, what are the health effects of living near uh, uh, refineries and uh, naturally contaminated uh, sites? Um, it has effects by population subgroup. What are the health benefits of green space in the urban environment? That's a nice line of work on green space that we, uh, that's out of interest for member states. Um, Waste is a topic, so one of the questions is what is the health impact of landfills uh, in Europe? Or, in the most acute cases of uh, waste and mismanagement, what's the health impact of uh, practices of uncontrolled informal um, waste, dumping and open air burning, kind of situations that are not so uncommon? Um, or, uh, what are the health implications of different alternative uh, transport policies, and transport is uh, a very well-developed um, sectoral area uh, because it, it also uh, benefits from strong um, underlying evidence on the um, health effects of uh, air pollutants, um, uh, noise, uh, road uh, injuries, uh, and, and so on. So it, it's um, a very Sort of at the sectoral level, it's a rich uh, kind of uh, chapter. But these are the types of questions that, uh, as you can see, call directly for, for the kind of uh, holistic um, uh, appro way of, of, uh, of studying that uh, is typical of the um, exposome uh, science. The, these needs are, uh, the kind of questions are not only confined to the environment and health um, part of WHO Europe. Um, we have a, a general um, <clears throat> overall uh, public health framework for the coming years uh, called Health 2020, which includes a number of um, pillars. And one of the, the uh, prominent um, uh, one of these uh, pillars is the life course. Only a few weeks ago, there was a ministerial conference on uh, <clears throat> On, on life course approach, and what you see at the screen is a draft, an, ex, an extract from, from the draft ministerial declaration on life course approach, which recognizes the importance of looking at the full uh, picture, the full trajectory of human life uh, and the various, um, the, the various pathways through which uh, health is uh, determined for good and bad. It uh, recognizes the, the importance of, uh, um, of a new emerging science. Um, therefore, there's a very promising, I would say, uh, area of further um, deployment of the exposome science in this particular uh, um, area of work of, of WHO. <laughs> so, um, the um, exposome seems to me very well placed for providing <coughs> Um, uh, really uh, important and innovative uh, support uh, to policy. It provides, it can provide a clear understanding of the uh, complex um, causal chains and webs of causation. So, undoubtedly, as been said already, more effective uh, prevention or uh, action is, is uh, warranted. It can be clearly uh, very important to target such action and such prevention measures to the most um, vulnerable uh, subgroups. And in this respect, 
you know, there's often a um, this issue of, you know, is it better to target action to the whole population or is it better to target the most uh, disadvantaged or most vulnerable uh, subgroups? This, uh, this uh, debate between sick individuals and sick populations, and I think the exposome can inform um, a lot uh, in that respect and inform the, um, the um, relevant uh, policy response to that. So with this, I think um, I, this already, I hope, uh, shows that uh, there's a strong, there can be a, and there will be a very strong demand from our uh, work in WHO and environment and health and beyond on uh, exposome um, science. Um, and I could uh, uh, effectively leave it at that, but I would like, beyond that, to try and share some reflections on, on um, how to best, uh, how to best uh, stimulate this uh, connection between the development of the exposome science and its application in, in, in policy making in, in Europe. And I'll use an example in an area that I've already mentioned, and we've, because we've done a lot of, we've been doing a lot of work on, which is the, the issue of uh, industrially contaminated sites uh, and health. Uh, which is a topic we've been engaged on for, for many years in different, in different ways. Now, contaminated sites, I'm referring mainly to the, the large, um, the large uh, industrial facilities which uh, mix a lot of different activities and uh, multiple agents, um, a variety of chemicals, multiple pathways, because these um, are, uh, the, the contaminants can be airborne, Waterborne, uh, they contaminate food and soil. So it's uh, it, it's, a, it's a very complex uh, picture all the time. It um, involves, of course, also a strong um, mixture of all of these uh, um, um, threats and, and agents with uh, different level of uh, health determinants because there is a strong, very often a very strong. Um, um, social gradient, and, and if you live near one of these plants, you tend to to, to have higher exposures to uh, lifestyle-related um, uh, risks. So it's uh, it's really one of the cases where you have a combination of multiple factors, multiple pressures um, that um, all play a combined role, and it's extremely difficult to to disentangle the various effects um, on people's health. The response to that complexity um, often is a sort of atomistic uh, as opposed to holistic um, approach whereby, for example, you, you select one or maybe a few uh, specific agents and you uh, go about it through, through uh, biomonitoring um, and uh, uh, therefore you, 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 you increase the accuracy on a certain dimension but it's one of many you lose sight of the whole picture, you might lose sight of the whole picture. Or on the other hand, um, a, a black box type of approach where you uh, essentially give up on, 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 on disentangling the complexity, you use um, crude uh, proxies like distance from a, a source, um, or you look at the uh, you only measure the health profile of a resident population and, and interpret um, and try to interpret uh, the possible excesses that you see uh, in, in, a, in a speculative way, which is, I mean, both of the approaches have actually produced very mm -hmm. interesting and informative results. But of course, um, better uh, understanding of, of the whole picture would be very desirable. In, in these, uh, <coughs> in these uh, um, studies, uh, all it's invariably, invariably the case that better exposure assessment is um, Involved as one of the weak points of, of, of this part of epidemiology. Um, there is an issue, I think, that better exposure assessment means that you have, you must have some form of uh, reference or gold standard in mind to, to improve your, your exposure assessment. <coughs> um, so uh, if that's not the case, because in, indeed it, it, it's Challenging, we wouldn't probably we wouldn't be able to specify, even if we had access to all uh, measurements. If you could biomonitor for a variety of uh, issues, it, it would be difficult to say what's the ideal uh, 
uh, exposure that we would go for. <coughs> um, so I, I see a lot of uh, scope, and it's been said already, for uh, the exposome approach not only to, to improve assessment, exposure assessment, but for identifying uh, relevant exposures, exposure metrics, exposure combinations to really um, identify through, especially I, I suppose through this untargeted omics approach, the uh, the most informative uh, pieces of, um, of of evidence and data and measurement that are likely to shed light on the on this complex uh, picture. Um, <clears throat> I think it's also very important to. Um, make a clear distinction between applications that aim at estimating effects, uh, hazard identification has been um, mentioned, um, as opposed to those who look at impact. Uh, as I mentioned, and again, I have pretty much this contaminated sites um, example in mind, but this applies to, to a variety of other situations. Uh, we, are of, we often face uh, the joint health effects of, of chemical agents. There are cumulative effects. There are uh, interactions. Um, there are also issues of uh, very, in our experience, very, very acute exposures that can be rather exceptional, but they, they do take place in, in, in many uh, situations. And as I mentioned, uh, these, mix, uh, these exposures can uh, mix with those related to lifestyle. So for, for um, a hazard identification, these are all uh, extremely um, challenging um, issues. For, on the other hand, for, health for, for estimating health impacts, and uh, especially using existing risk functions, uh, well, there is, a, um, <clears throat> I think, a very good potential for improving the, uh, our understanding of the distribution of uh, those impacts by, by subgroups, as I mentioned earlier. And I think, in, in our experience, it's really, I mean, we face, uh, in, in the case of contaminated sites or waste, uh, really bad environments where, where the, the, all the pressures seem to, to occur and it's places where um, you wouldn't uh, want to live. Uh, and what's really the impact of, of those environments? I think we are uh, very much behind because we, we on estimating those because we tend to break it down to the various components and, and the sum of the of the comp the total is more than the sum of, of the um, of the uh, components. And I would like to say that for some of these things, it's really the policy debate or the or the field experience that can. Uh, be helpful to inform the research agenda because some of the, for example, these extreme exposures or the, you know, the, the, the way in which a variety of different risk factors tend to insist on the same people is really something that, um, I mean, it can be, the hypothesis can be created through observation of reality of, uh, from Listening to uh, to the questions that come from the field or from or from governments of certain uh, countries where the uh, environment and health is so problematic, much more than in other uh, places in Western Europe, for example. <coughs> um, another point uh, I'd like to mention is um, the use of the exposome for again on assessing impacts and in the. In some of the documents that I've seen, there's also a reference to assessing burden of disease. So very much the, the use of uh, enhanced uh, exposure assessment to be fed into uh, already well-developed machineries like the burden of disease. Um, I think, I mean, I've always, there's always a bit of a problem, I think, uh, when it comes to using a better, um, highly... Um, um, accurate uh, exposure assessment. Uh, if you take the case, for example, of uh, air pollution, which is a classic, well, essentially, m most of the evidence we have for, for large-scale burden of disease assessment, uh, especially on the long-term uh, effects, uh, health effects, which are the, the, by far the biggest, uh, that epidemiology, those risks come from, from um, um, 
large scale city comparison type of uh, of, um, of studies. So exposures in those studies uh, come from very um, uh, very uh, general, I would say, very diluted measures of, of averages. Uh, of course, we're controlling that in, in, in reality individual level studies, although uh, uh, the unit, uh, the initial unit of observation is, is um, city level or, or similar. Uh, but there's, uh, one wonders whether it, it's really appropriate to combine an exposure that comes from, um, uh, for example, individual monitoring throughout the day or throughout a lifetime to those uh, relative risks. Um, I think it, it would be worth exploring a little bit what can go wrong in, in that, in, in the epidemiology, there's a lot of, certainly a lot of dilution involved. Maybe the real relative risks, if one had the, that level of information, would be quite um, higher. Uh, therefore, the, the, the burden disease can be uh, somehow, I suspect, um, uh, biased. There's also an issue of, <coughs> of um, well, I guess communication or handling this kind of information. It, 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 by adding more, uh, more uh, pieces of information, more by breaking down the, 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 the the causal chain into its components, as the exosome will, will certainly do, uh, this issue of uh, when, when you talk about attributable uh, fractions uh, and the problem of that they, we know they sum up to more than 100%, which is always a bit difficult to, to handle, um, will, will, it will get worse. There will be more, uh, uh, more addenda, more uh, items that will make the, the overall total much more than 100% than it is now it will become a little more difficult to talk about counterfactuals or fixed scenarios because um, they will not be very realistic in that the, the kind of uh, these exercises are based on all the rest being equal type of comparisons. That will become more difficult to, to, um, to make because you know, if, you have, if you describe a complex uh, web of causation, if you touch one, uh, only one um, piece of it, you, you'll need to, to consider how uh, the, the, this perturbation will, will spread throughout uh, this, this um, interconnected web of causation. So this will be a little more difficult to, to handle, I think. And to find uh, my last slide, um, I think it's uh, this idea that uh, the, uh, the exosome is, will reduce uncertainty. I think it's not really happening. Um, you might know of uh, some literature on post-normal science, um, and, and I mean, there's a very ways of formulating this uh, concept that has pointed out the limitations of the traditional approach that has risk uh, assessment uh, as a as isolated kind of uh, activity, the production of evidence that is then fed into the into the risk, in the risk management phase. It, it, it's not really, uh, it doesn't really work like that in reality. In fact, we see as, uh, on a daily basis that despite the, 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 the impressive um, progress in a number of our scientific fields, including our own, the uncertainty is not diminishing. We, we solve a certain question and another 10 questions um, um, come up. And it's a, more or less a fact of life that mature sciences uh, work like that. You, you, you expand your, your uh, horizon of, of research and you see more and more uncertain coming up. So for me, it's much more um, likely that the exosome will not so much reduce uncertainty, but rather help to embrace complexity. And by that I mean uh, the fact that, you know, uh, we should be better equipped to be able to deal with the, the complexity of, of, of real life, of environmental uh, uh, health determinants. Uh, we should, uh, it's been said already, uh, so uh, that's um, great, that a better description of the uncertainty and, and characterization of uncertainty will be very much one of the um, beyond its accuracy would be one of the, the best uh, results, I think. Um, interactions between uh, risk factors, non-monotonic relationships, 
adaptive mechanisms. So these are all uh, issues that we will increasingly shed light on, but as I say, I think very much I expect that they will make the picture um, increase the, 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 the complexity and uncertainty. Um, so out of all this, my, my suggestion would be that a number of these considerations will be easier to, to, to address and, and to keep in mind uh, for, for everybody in the scientific community to, to, to refer to through uh, a closer uh, relationship between the, commu the, the research community and the, and the policy world. This is very much something we try to do in our work. We try to bring together the, the two because it, in reality the, the process of decision making and production of evidence is not as simple as it cannot be clear cut into the, in the two the two phases very easily, and uh, we find that uh, a closer dialogue between um, the various people involved is um, always uh, beneficial. And with that, I'll uh, finish and I'll um, pass over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. So now we have the second expert uh, uh, who is talking about uh, what policy needs and expects uh, from the exposure of science. Uh, Tina Bahadori, uh, who is involved also in, uh, in risk assessment from the U.S. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency. Perfect. Tina? So I um, uh, went uh, sort of more, a little more pragmatic uh, in uh, my presentation because there are a lot of the issues that were brought up by previous speakers are not only cogent, uh, but they're very much in the forefront of what we're trying to do here at EPA. And let me also clarify that I actually do not uh, do the risk assessments, and I'm also not a policy person. I'm a science policy interface here in the organization. So I just want to be very clear on that. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about is what are the research interfaces that I think need to happen in order for the science to be used in decision making. And so that's why the title of the presentation is From Data to Decisions, 21st Century Understanding of Exposures. And um, I'll just quickly go through sort of the background from where I'm coming from, so where you, my... Can you put it into uh, full screen? Sorry to interrupt. Can you put it into full screen mode? Okay. Okay. That should be it. Yes. Okay, good. So, um, so from our perspective, from the perspective of what my program is, which is in the chemical safety, a research program, chemical safety for sustainability, uh, what we're faced with is the ubiquity of uh, chemicals all around us. So that's... Uh, um, uh, consistent with what the earlier speaker said and a lot of the motivation for the types of studies that are going on. And, and in the realm that we operate, there's very, very little information about exposures. There's even very, even very little information about surrogates of exposure. So in this fairly chemical-rich environment, we're operating with an essentially with an absolute absence of information in a fairly ignorant environment. Um, on top of it, there are exposures that are deliberate, understood, incorporated, um, because we know where to look and we know what to look at. And then there's an array of incidental exposures. So from a public health perspective, we know that we're exposed to multiple chemicals at very low doses, but we don't really understand uh, what that, the relevance of, of uh, those exposures are from a risk assessment perspective or to human health. Um, and, and then, you know, even if we do the studies to deeply characterize these exposures, historically we've really focused on characterizing exposures for a fairly small cohort of individuals whom we could measure ad nauseum. Uh, but now the question is uh, whether uh, what is the, the the relationship between a population threshold versus individual th threshold, and what is the role of uh, vulnerability and baseline and background risks to understanding population health? And I think this is where the exposome gives us information we've never had really before to work with. Um, and it's clear that uh, the way currently we do chemical safety evaluations, whether it's through risk assessment or risk-based evaluations, needs to be transformed. And it really needs to begin to incorporate a much better understanding of exposures that's not just derived from toxicological experiments. 
Um, and then, uh, as uh, uh, almost everyone said ahead of time, that there is an issue of uh, multiple and mixed exposures, and recent papers are also providing a lot of evidence, not evidence that's well understood, but evidence that's clearly intriguing, is that the, uh, you know, the issue of mixtures is one thing, the issue of multiple exposures that may or may not act uh, simultaneously, but could have synergistic effects uh, on the onset of disease is something that really needs to be understood better, and this has been particularly relevant to understanding um, cancer. Um, and, then, uh, and then something that we haven't even really begun to incorporate, but the exposome gets us there, is those interactions between chemicals and non-chemical stressors. Um, so that's why we're at the EPA are very, very excited in the science that was uh, described in the two projects at the beginning. But the issue is that from a regulatory perspective, and, and I have this issue even in terms of the research that we generate in our program, that the regulatory approaches tend to be based on risk assessments. And I may put that in plural because even though as a science there's some principles and risk assessments, how a risk assessment is conducted is very much contextualized in the law or the regulatory environment that's driving. So we do something different for foods, we do something different for chemicals, we do something different for pesticides. And so there's a lot of um, information uh, uh uh, judgment and manipulation that goes on in a risk assessment that informs a, a regulatory decision. On top of it, most traditionally, because of the absence of exposure uh, information, there's been heavy, heavy reliance on hazard inf uh, evaluation that, frankly, has been mostly informed by traditional animal toxicology. All of that is changing. That universe is changing both uh, from the perspective of toxicology, but it's, uh, but it's also being enriched by the uh, transformations in exposure science, including the exposome. Um, sorry, this next bullet should have said the public health approach. In, con in contrast, the approaches that are embraced in an exposomic framework are really those that are consistent with the public health perspective. So, so there's a lot of inherent conflict with many aspects of a public health approach or one that's embedded in an exposome type study from that which is a regulatory approach. Um, in, in this public health approach, the agent, the host, and the environmental factors are all important con uh, components of an evaluation and they're taken into con consideration in the studies. Um, it, the focus is often on disease and disease uh, prevention, but not so much on um, sort of probability of an adversity or a number of cases. So um, uh, the, the types of studies that we're talking about, specifically the ones Martina talked about, focus on susceptible and vulnerable populations. And in, in a traditional risk assessment, we would have to really work with the data to be able to address the issues uh, related to susceptible and vulnerable populations. Um, and in a, from a public health a perspective, the focus is never on that bright line above which something happens, below which something else happens. It's a lot of information is used to improve or evaluate uh, public health uh, and uh, to uh, minimize risk. So these very different perspectives uh, really result in, in outcomes that are, uh, even though intentions may be good, uh, the data uh, cannot really be used in the way that, uh, that one would hope that they could be used. So, um, so what I think needs to happen, and I think we're, uh, I would uh, at least like to invest in, as in our program, as we're beginning to think about uh, uh, the um, uh, application of the exposome uh, data into any kind of decision making is that, you know, to begin with, there's going to be a lot of uh, sort of need to invest in stakeholder engagement and in education and understanding of what is uh, the expectation for the emerging data from these types of studies and what we can expect um, this data will tell us. So we're going to have to do, we can't just dump the data out there and hope that decision makers will use it. We're going to need to do a lot of education into what these data, uh, what value the data are going to have. 
Um, we're going to have to explain as we are in the, in the context of toxicology is to use a framework, of, for example, the adverse outcome framework to begin to use that as a way to organize the, com- the complex information that's coming from the exposome studies and to begin to talk about how this informs us about cumulative exposures, cumulative risk, and altogether understanding the exposure effect interactions. So we need some kind of a corollary in the exposure community to the adverse outcome pathway. What do these life course exposures tell us about vulnerability, susceptibility, and risk? And we need to begin to talk about that. And, and, and as Marco said, we, this is an embracing of complexity, but that means that in tandem with, with embracing complexity, we're going to have to bring exposure science into informing mechanistic understanding of disease and adverse effects, which means that we're going to have to begin integrate understanding of exposure, dose, effect across all levels of biology. So we need information at a cellular level. We need information at a population level, and the exposome can provide that information to us. Uh, We also can explain that a better understanding between exposure effect interactions, which is where the exposome really resides, gives us an ability to not wait for a full-blown adverse effect, but to begin to understand and anticipate and and, uh, and, uh, look for those earlier tipping points. So we don't have to know whether a trigger causes you know, exactly a specific disease before we address that perturbation, but the exposome allows us to have an earlier understanding of what type of perturbations are going to result in adverse effect or effects that we would like to uh, prevent or preempt up front. Um, the exposome also for the first time, again, gives us this ability to focus on developmental health health and this focus on vulnerable and susceptible populations and life stages, really, which is something we've not done very well. And it allows us to begin to account for early life exposures with lifelong health implications. Again, the animal models that we use to inform risk assessments don't have capacity at this point in time to give us this information. So now that studies like these exposome studies give us this type of data, coupled with a lot of other epi studies that are out there, the question is, do we know how to use this information? And this has to be done collaboratively, again, between the research community and the user community. Otherwise, there's going to be a massive lag in the system in terms of using these data. And we're going to have to move towards sort of higher throughput approaches because we're talking about a much larger, from having had no exposure information to having these large volumes of data across populations is going to require a different kind of capacity building. So my proposal and where we're going in our program is to really plan for and invest in this data and science integration into decision-making and that the community needs to come together on understanding and agreeing on how we're going to integrate these complex data sources and, and, and use them to inform policy. Um, decisions. Just again in our program, we, we've been generating through programs here at EPA and through collaborations with NIH and FDA, we've been generating a lot of toxicity pathway data or tox gas and tox 21 data and we're uh, up to almost uh, 10,000 chemicals. So new data on 10,000 chemicals. We are trying to couple that with exposure information and ground truth it. The exposome gives us a a very new source of data. (coughs) And and the question is, can these pathway-based data help us draw out, as as, uh, Chris said, uh, we're now getting a lot of exposure information about individuals and then getting that across a lot of individuals. (coughs) Excuse me. Can the pathway-based approaches uh, begin to allow us to integrate across these different uh, uh, data domains that are emerging. And then, um, uh, and I think this might be my last slide, is that uh, I know that because in EPA we're anticipating that this is something that we won't be able to do on our own. We have asked the National Academies of Science to begin to 
uh, give us some guidance on how do we integrate these 21st century um, decisions, uh, this, the 21st century data into the decision frameworks, into risk assessments, and into risk-based evaluations. And we're hoping that this guidance and the report from this uh, committee that should come out in mid-2016 will at least help us start that conversation around how what uh, what data integration across these complex platforms is going to look like. Um, so I think from a policy perspective, there's tremendous enthusiasm, but also a lot of trepidation because we need to really have a better understanding on how this is going to work. So I'll stop right here. Uh, thank you very much, Tina. Uh, I, I thank all the speakers for the very clear presentations.